thank you very much um, everybody for joining us really uh, good afternoon and uh, good day to you all uh, it gives me great pleasure also to welcome professor maria malatar for this uh, seminar today uh, thank you very much for agreeing to to uh, present the seminar and thank you very much also for sharing your paper so as you probably remember but if you don't i'll just quickly uh, recap uh, professor maria malatar is uh, um, based at the University of Jordan and where she teaches courses in ethics, Islamic studies, world religions, and philosophy. Her main interest is in Islamic ethics, particularly meta ethics in medieval Arab Islamic thought, and also contemporary moral uh, thinking, as she is presenting in her paper today. Interestingly, you might have seen that she was, a, she, was, uh, she, was work, she worked as a physician. Um, and a clinical scientist in Jordanian, Jordanian, Jordanian hospitals in, in the UK before. She has a book uh, of 2010. Um, a book is called, uh, I know I've, I've read it before and I, I sort of uh, uh, was very much interested in inviting you for that reason, Islamic Ethics, Dim Divine Command Theory and Arab Islamic Thought. She has also several uh, book chapters and articles. If anybody likes, I can share the, with your permission, I can share that CV with you. So today's presentation is on uh, thinking about understanding ethics as a branch of moral philosophy and Islamic disciplines. This interesting combination of these two. It builds upon theories pertaining to ethics in Islamic thought and in contemporary moral philosophy to provide answers to perennial philosophical questions about the nature of morality and moral judgments. So I think that this very concise and very ambitious task is something that we really look forward to hear you talking about. As we agreed, you've got about 30 minutes to 45, 40, 30 to 40 minutes. You might go a little bit up to 45, but uh, and then after that, we'll have a time for question and discussion. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdul Qadir, for having me in this seminar. It is uh, a great honor and privilege to be participating in uh, your seminar. I know that you are one of the first seminars to be kind of dedicated to the study of Islamic ethics. Uh, just a small correction, I'm not studying and I'm not teaching in the University of Jordan. I am currently at the American University of Sharjah, but I did talk at the University of Jordan before. All right, apologies for that. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, start by uh, uh, talking about my paper and uh, what uh, are the main or the, fun, the most important questions and what is the aim of uh, this presentation. Uh, this presentation kind of overlaps with the presentation that I have given uh, a few months ago, uh, but uh, still it, uh, it, there are a few new ideas that I also added to this presentation. Well, so the aim actually of uh, my paper on which I am basing this presentation is to engage uh, with questions such as, what is it that distinguishes morality or ethics from other normative views like legal views, social views, uh, and so on? Are there any universal and objective moral uh, norms? Uh, are ethical values and norms uh, discovered or are they constructed? Now, uh, I try to develop, to develop reasonable answers uh, based uh, on one side on uh, classical Islamic theories that pertain to ethics uh, and also on some recent developments in ethics or moral philosophy. Um, uh, questions like the above mentioned uh, are important for establishing a philosophical foundation for ethical thought. Uh, indeed, uh, I think that they can't be disregarded, especially uh, in a time uh, when the ethical perspective uh, is being prioritized by many Muslim scholars and reformers, uh, such as, to just mention a few, uh, Khaled Abul Fadl, uh, who argues that the classical juristic 
uh, tradition must be examined and interrog interrogated through what he calls the probative lens of ethical and moral theory. Uh, on the Ibrahim Musa, who was also hosted by the seminar uh, one month ago, uh, who says that Muslims today must work to make the ethical apparatus the lens through which one evaluates practices. Uh, he also says, Ibrahim Musa, ethics cannot be beyond reason and rationality. Uh, now, uh, what, what is ethics uh, and uh, which branch of ethics is related to the questions about the nature and foundations of morality? So in, uh, in the coming few minutes, I will talk about the meaning of ethics and to which branch of uh, ethics or moral philosophy I think that this, uh, uh, the questions that I have raised at the beginning correspond. Uh, ethics or moral philosophy uh, investigates and questions the prevailing moral norms and uh, seeks to understand and uh, deeply understand the nature of morality. Uh, it is usually divided to three branches, normative ethics, meta-ethics, and applied ethics. Uh, now, uh, normative ethics investigates norms, uh, principles, and rules that should guide human behavior. Uh, Metaethics investigates the meaning, the nature, the foundations of those norms and principles, while uh, applied ethics uh, is that field of inquiry uh, that applies moral uh, norms uh, to different uh, human activities, including uh, or those who are doing practical ethics, they engage with uh, uh, medical ethics, business ethics, engineering ethics, uh, finance ethics, environment ethics, and so on. Uh, some examples of normative ethics, if uh, we should bring some examples, for example, one ought to help others if she can. And uh, respecting your parents is an obligation, examples of normative ethics. While meta-ethics seeks to understand the terms and the concepts employed in normative ethics. So it will be asking like, what, what is the meaning of good? What is the meaning of bad? What is the meaning of ought? Uh, what is the meaning of obligation and so on? So it seeks to understand the terms and the concepts employed in normative ethics. Uh, it is about the meaning of the terms and the epistemological and the ontological assumptions of normative ethics. We are usually engaged in meta-ethics when we investigate the criteria for what is accepted as a good reason in ethics, uh, or in other words, the foundations of moral judgment. Therefore, one can say that the main issues that concern this paper properly belong to meta-ethics rather than normative or applied ethics. Although uh, sometimes the three fields uh, are kind of overlap or are interwined. Now, how is that all related to uh, what uh, we can call Islamic ethics or ethics that uh, developed in the Islamic tradition or that uh, scholars are still developing in Islam? Ethics or moral philosophy, uh, in the sense understood today, has never been a separate domain of inquiry in traditional Islamic disciplines. I mean, like al-fiqh, al-kalam, al-tasawwuf. This does not mean that morality was not a concern to classical Muslim scholars. On the contrary, all the disciplines of religious science were pervaded by moral concerns. Some contemporary scholars contributing to the field of Islamic ethics sometimes classify different trends in Islamic ethics under four main disciplines. So they talk about ethics in Kalam or speculative theology, in Fiqh and Usul al Fiqh in tasawwuf, Islamic mysticism, and in falsafa, uh, properly philosophy, meaning mainly philosophy that was done in the Greek tradition. Uh, never, uh, nevertheless, nevertheless uh, if one is concerned with questions related to ethics, uh, rather than the history of ethical thought in Islam, 
then uh, identifying and discussing different normative and meta-ethical theories in Islamic thought might be a, a better approach to the study of ethics. I think that uh, valid ethical arguments cross disciplinary boundaries between the above mentioned Islamic disciplines and also, which I think is important, trump any sectorial affiliations, they trump any sectorial affiliation. Now, uh, issues pertaining to ethics uh, were discussed in Kalam. Uh, Kalam is sometimes translated to a speculative, dialectical, or even philosophical theology. Uh, issues such as human free will uh, or capacity for action, the nature of moral values, uh, moral ontology, moral epistemology, those are issues that were discussed under the Kalam tradition or in the works of Kalam. Issues pertaining to meta-ethics are best discussed in the works of Kalam, as I think. Also, uh, the the philosopher, the Lebanese uh, British philosopher, George Hurani, rightly maintained that Kalam is second major occurrence in the history of a profound discussion on the meaning and general content of ethical concepts. So it is in Kalam that we find a profound discussion about the meaning of ethical terms, which means a metaethics mainly in the contemporary uh, language to use like contemporary ethical language. Now, well, the first for uh, George Farani was uh, the ancient Greek philosophy. So Kalam uh, comes after the ancient Greek philosophy on the second uh, period of discussion, discussing issues related to metaethics. Uh, my own inquiry uh, into the nature of moral judgment and the foundations of morality was in fact motivated by the ideas and arguments that I encountered while studying uh, works of Kalam, especially uh, the work written by Abdul Jabbar bin Ahmed al Asadabadi, who died in 1025 of the, of the Common Era, called Al Mughni fi Abwab al Tawheed wal Adl. Uh, that work prompt, uh, prompted me to search for a refinement and elucidation of some rudimentary ideas that were presented in the work of Abdul Jabbar, like the idea of rationality, aql, and objectivity of moral judgments. I could not find what I was looking for in the works of his successors, um, the Ash'ari successors, for example, uh, or his opponents. I found uh, that elsewhere in the later developments made in the field of ethics or uh, in actually in contemporary uh, philosophy. Morality in, uh, in my view is not absolute and static as assumed by uh, those who are sometimes called moral realists and it is also not relative to individuals or societies. Uh, morality is not relative to individual or societies as assumed by the proponents of what is called ethical relativism. Well, before I proceed, it is important to mention uh, that judgment, ahkam in Arabic, in Islamic thought, are uh, sometimes divided into two categories, al-ibadat, concerning ritual worship, and al-mu'amalat concerning interactions between humans. Uh, and it is actually within the latter, according to Khaled Abu al that innovations or creative determinations are favored. Also, the earliest Muslim theologians, the Mu'tazilites, distinguish between what they called uh, rational obligation, obligation, taklif al-aqli, and religious obligation, or taklif al-sam'i. Now, uh, any reconstruction of moral theories that are compatible with contemporary morality and relevant to current moral concern uh, thus belong to the realm of mu'amalat and rational obligation. And it is mainly concerned with what is obliged by reason without contradicting what is obliged by revelation. Now, uh, there are four uh, distinct views 
the, uh, that were developed in early Islamic theology or early Kalam and uh, that uh, ground morality for distinct views that were given for the meaning of Hassan and Qubah. Uh, when we say that ground morality, those are the grounds of the moral judgment or if you wish, uh, legal uh, ethical judgments like al-wajib, al-mustahab, al-mubah, al-makruh, in English obligatory, uh, recommended, permissible, discouraged, and prohibited. Uh, those are judgments of actions, uh, and uh, but they are grounded in value judgment, in husn and qubah, in good and evil. Actually, grounding moral judgment in value judgment is what allows for rationalization in the field of ethics. So one can say that some an act is obligatory or prohibited or recommended because it is good or because it is bad, because it is hasan or because it is qabih. Early Muslim scholars, and when I say early Muslim scholars, I mean like those who lived between somewhere 750 and 950, developed different understandings of the foundation of moral judgment, or good and bad, al-husr wal qubah. Abd al-Jabbar al-Asadabadi al informed us that, he says, the reason for any act being evil must be intelligible either by, by having a particular state, hal, or determinant cause, ma'na, or due to the state of the agent. For there is no difference, according to Abdul Jabbar, between saying that some acts are evil for no intelligible, for no, for an unintelligible reason, or say, sorry, saying that they are evil for no reason at all. In other, in other words, Abdul Jabbar distinguished between uh, three positions regarding the ultimate grounds of goodness and badness. The first position, and let me just speak rather than read so that I will not go like uh, exceed my time limit. Uh, the first position uh, mainly distinguished the early Mu'tazilites. He belonged to the Mu'tazila, but as it is well known, they are not a mono. mono, mono monolithic group. They had scholars who had different views and held different positions and ideas about morality. So the first position uh, which uh, grounds morality in husn wa qubah that are kind of part of the structure of nation of nature, calling it ma'na, is what distinguishes the view of the early Mu'tazila and including Abu Ali uh, the father of the master or uh, one of the masters of Abdul Jabbar. Uh, according to this position, actually, um, the, the ground of morality, something is good or bad, but the goodness or badness are kind of added to the acts. Uh, but Abdul Jabbar uh, doesn't accept this view. Uh, he, uh, he says that uh, indeed uh, good and bad are not intrinsic properties of actions. He gives a classical example of sujood. He says like sujood is one and the same action, but uh, if it is performed uh, for God, it is good. If it is performed for Satan, it is considered evil. So there is nothing intrinsic in the act of sujood itself that makes it good and evil. Um, for simplicity, I call this position a natural position. And it is clear that it is a, a kind of uh, moral realism uh, since it considers that uh, moral values are part of the st natural structure of the world. So it is definitely moral realism. Uh, the second position that he, uh, that he considers is the position that uh, good and evil or husn wal qubah, good and bad, depend on human beings, uh, like our uh, desires and aversions. But uh, according to him, this is also uh, not possible. And this is, by the way, uh, an, uh, a view that is compatible with what, what is now called um, moral relativism. According to Abdul Jabbar, like this is not possible because even the same person might have uh, might view something differently at different times. 
so uh, this is not the case with moral values such as wrongdoing and justice. Uh, this might be the case with uh, with the values that are related to like beauty and uh, of a certain objects like uh, aesthetical beauty, but it is not related to uh, morality. For according to Abdul Jabbar, all rational people agree on the evilness of such acts like uh, wrongdoing and uh, injustice. So the view that morality is based in, uh, in our uh, desires and aversions is compatible with uh, ethical relativism and is also rejected and refuted by Abdul Jabbar. Like he spends uh, quite like many pages in refuting each of the positions about the grounds of morality in his book, al Bukhni. But I'm just trying to summarize that quickly to see where that takes us and how can we benefit from that. The third position which he considers is actually his own position, uh, which says that morality is grounded in the state of the action itself. So it is not the action as it is, but it is hal, uh, the state of the action, al-hal. Therefore, it is not an intrinsic property of an action, that qualifies it as good or evil, but aspects of an actions that provide good reasons for certain judgments expressed by Abdul Jabbar as wajh al and wajh al husn Let us call this view a constructivist position, or let's say like restricted constructivism. Uh, why is that? Because according to this view, the truth of moral judgment is not simply there waiting to be discovered, since it, since it depends on the circumstances and the consequences of the action that is evaluated. The truth of moral judgment, according to this view, is akin to a version of constructivism that also depends on the outputs of our reasoning procedures that take into consideration different factors. Of course, in addition to the three uh, positions mentioned above, uh, ethical relativism, uh, ethical naturalism, and uh, uh, ethical constructivism, we have to mention another position, which was definitely discussed by Abdul Jabbar as well, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is actually the position usually called uh, by some scholars, theological voluntarism or ethical voluntarism sometimes referred to as divine command theory. Uh, according to this view, uh, good and evil are ultimately based on revelation. Moral values, husn wal qubah, or good and bad, good and evil, are established and known to us only through divine commands and prohibitions. This view is usually mistaken for being the truly religious one. Why usually mistaken for being truly religious one? Well, because uh, it's important to clarify that referring to a text in a case of disagreement on a legal matter is one thing, while holding that moral values exclusively depend, exclusively depend on scripture is another thing. Ethical or theological voluntarism as argued by contemporary scholars, for example, uh, Ramon Harvey in his latest book, Quran and Justice, uh, he says it gives ethical voluntarism or this position, which is mainly an Ashharite position, it gives the opportunity for political authority to be held in God's name, in God's name. Also, as uh, argued by Ziba Mir Husseini, it allows for social norms and practices to be sanctified and turned into fixed entities. What, uh, what I think actually that the last position, ethical voluntarism um, adopted by the Ashaira has in common with the first one uh, adopted by the early Mu'tazila or mainly the Baghdadian Mu'tazila, what they have in common is that uh, both, uh, both assume that good and evil uh, and right and wrong need to be discovered rather than constructed. According to ethical voluntarism, 
normative values are grounded in divine commands and prohibitions. While according to the naturalist, uh, natural position, like which grounds uh, moral values in a ma'na, which is uh, part of, of the structure of the natural world, um, uh, also uh, grounds, uh, grounds moral values in nature. Thus, both views are compatible with a version of moral realism. Moral realists hold that there are objective, mind-independent facts and properties. Mind-independent, mind independent, uh, objective facts that can only be discovered as they actually are. Also, moral realism, like voluntarism and naturalism, implies that moral truth is absolute and moral truth is static. And here I am talking about the moral judgments. I'm not talking about universal, absolute uh, moral values. However, it is worth mentioning that in practice, uh, in practice, even uh, the medieval uh, classical jurist who adopted uh, one of those positions ethical voluntarism or uh, naturalistic position, uh, they uh, actually did not discover uh, real and true moral judgment that represent matters of fact or absolute, absolute divine judgment. Indeed, they constructed rather than discovered God's law, as argued by uh, many uh, scholars, including Ziba al-Husseini, Ziba Mir al-Husseini. Right. Now, if moral judgments uh, are constructed, like how can they be true or false? How can moral judgments be true or false without representing um, some kind of mind independent uh, normative facts about the world? This is uh, the topic of the last part of, uh, this is the topic of like the last part of uh, my presentation. Now, there is a view that kind of uh, quite uh, relatively recent view in, um, in moral philosophy, which is, uh, which is called constructivism. And there are like different versions of constructivism. I think like the best uh, version to adopt uh, if we are to develop a kind of uh, ethics that is compatible with Islam is kind of a restrictive, restricted version of constructivism. And we are not the first to be doing that. Like there are some other philosophers who talked about constricted constructivism. Um, this is the view that entails that. And uh, that's why I think it is important and useful. Uh, it entails that there are objective criteria of moral judgment insofar as there are objective criteria about how to reason about practical matters. For, for example, there are objective reasons uh, that prohibit deceiving and manipulating others, but such reasons are the result of moral reasoning. Accordingly, moral judgments can be true or false without representing mind-independent mind normative, normative facts about the world. Since moral judgment actually, as argued by a Muslim contemporary philosopher, Baad al-Dahir, have no ontological connotations. However, it is to be strongly emphasized that stripping ethics from any ontological grounds does not mean stripping it from any rational grounds. Objectivity does not require any version of moral realism that would render morality static and absolute, yet it requires the fulfillment of certain conditions, which to use the Islamic terminology can be called shurut husn taklif objectivity, I think, I think. Uh, requires the fulfillment of certain conditions, which to use the Islamic terminology, are called shurut husn taklif or the conditions of moral uh, obligation. 
what are the conditions of moral obligations? What are shurut husni taklif, those presuppositions or conditions uh, that are required, that are, are to be fulfilled uh, if a certain judgment is to be considered true or moral? Well, classical Muslim scholars developed what can be considered as morally neutral uh, principles for evaluating moral judgments. Moral judgments to remind you, like uh, wajib, uh, what else, makruh, mahdur, and so on. Uh, those principles um, are discussed under the title of shurut husn taklif, which can be translated to conditions of valid obligation, or better, the presuppositions, the presuppositions of moral judgments. Uh, Sahban Khlifat, the late professor of ethics at the University of Jordan, indicated that the mutakallimun, scholars of kalam, have articulated such presuppositions in great detail, which indicates that they were aware of the importance of such conditions in evaluating normative judgments. The Mu'tazilai, Abdul Jabbar, proposed and defended some morally neutral principles for evaluating moral judgments, these conditions can be divided into two. Uh, first, the conditions that are related to the agent himself, and second, the conditions that are related to the judgment itself. The first condition, which is related to the agent, includes, uh, for example, uh, him being capable of performing the actions, him being capable of understanding the judgment, and according to Abdul Jabbar, a responsible human being, Mukallaf, an agent, is the one who is able to act, Qadr should be able to act, knowing alam, living high and willing murid. Um, for according to Abdul Jabbar, imposing an obligation that is impossible or intolerable is considered irrational. Taklif ma la qabih. Moral judgment is irrational unless it presupposes a certain physical and mental capacity on the part of the addressee that makes him or her responsible for the choice uh, and the action. The second, uh, the second conditions of uh, moral judgment, shurut husn taklif uh, includes um, that the judgment be purpose, purposeful, so purposefulness, rationality, objectivity, impartiality, and universality. That is according to the classical uh, Muslim scholars represented by Qadi Abdul Jabbar. It's not only his views, he actually, he was the one who represented his school of thought in the time. And some of the views that he wrote uh, actually are ascribed to the previous scholars or his teachers. Um, so for a moral judgment has to be uh, purposeful and not arbitrary. Thus, if one had no purpose in assigning an obligation, then the assignment of the obligation would be irrational. A moral judgment, in order to be valid, needs to apply for everyone, including, according to Abu Jabbar, the atheist, al mulhida who know the evilness of injustice, although they do not know the divine command or the commander. A rational human being or an adult with a sound mind, al-aqil, should do what is obligatory by reason, wajibun fi aqlihi, for its goodness, according to, I'm also quoting Abdul Jabbar. The impartiality of ethical judgment is exemplified in Abdul Jabbar's thought when he said, an action, if considered evil for occurring in a certain way, then it must be evil from any agent if it occurs in the same way. Moreover, Abdul Jabbar, the Muslim theologian from the 11th century says, being obliged by God, and that might sound controversial, he says being obliged by God is not a condition 
for the obligation, which implies that not all obligations and rules, in my view, are mentioned in the Quran. Moral obligations and moral rules are or should be constructed, taking into consideration the core Quranic moral values, core Quranic universal moral values, because not all the obligations, of course, are mentioned in the Quran. And that's why he says that being obliged by God is not a condition for an obligation. There are some obligations that human beings can construct uh, by using certain moral values uh, that are mentioned in the Quran. There is a core or divine universal value that are shared by all human beings and emphasized in the Quran, like al-adl, al-ihsan, al-birr, al-rahma, al-mawadda, al-qist, and so on. But morality uh, in, encompasses not only the abstract universal values, it includes quotes of practice and rules that determine duties, obligations, and rights. These are constructed by taking into consideration not only the core values that you just mentioned, but also the advancement made in psychology, neurology, anthropology, and other fields of knowledge. In addition to that, any judgment, uh, rule or principle, any moral judgment must satisfy rules of practical reason. That might remind you of Kant, definitely. And um, to use Abdul Jabbar's terminology, any obligation to be a rational obligation, taklif akli, has to conform to the rules of practical reason. These rules of practical reason as articulated now not by Abdul Jabbar because he talked about rationality and hinted to objectivity, but he did not develop the rules of practical reason. That's why I said that I was looking somewhere else in order to see like, what is it that distinguishes a moral judgment from another judgment which is not moral. And I found that in the work of Adil Daher. Uh, for him, uh, the rules of practical reason include the rule that acting accordingly, according to it is absolutely mandatory. This can be interpreted, interpreted as saying, of course, do not treat others or do not accept treating others, except in a way that you want to be treated if you were occupying the same position that the other occupies. Five minutes and I will be done. Um, it should be clear, by the way, that rejecting the absolute character of normative ethics does not mean rejecting the absoluteness of the moral perspective. For example, the norms and application, the norms and the application of the norms in certain situations can vary according, can vary following certain details and circumstances which require the application of the norm. Thus, a normative rule which says, for example, one should never steal or stealing is wrong, is not an absolute normative rule, as there are definitely situations when stealing to feed a dying person is the right thing to do. Rejecting the absoluteness of such rules does not mean rejecting the absoluteness of a moral perspective as moral, consideration, moral considerations of Adil, justice, and Ihsan, for example, are the reasons be, even behind breaking such normative rules. The second rule of practical reason, uh, according to Adil al-Dahir, is that what is required by moral rule cannot be overruled by considerations that do not belong to the domain of ethics like legal consideration or considerations of self-interest. Ethical considerations have the priority over any other considerations. A good example is that uh, when the Muslim jurist uh, in the past wondered what to do with the divine moral injunction, by the way, Adil Daher does not bring any examples from the Islamic history here, 
that is my addition. So I think a good example for how like the, the moral rule uh, should overrule any other rule. Uh, this is something that has not been followed in by the uh, old medieval jurist. Uh, since a good example is uh, that um, um, when the moral when the Muslim jurist in the past wondered what to do with the divine moral injunctions revealed in the Quran, which says uh, God commands adil, justice and ihsan, they were aware that the concept of justice requires equity, but they found that problematic. Thus the Muslim jurist and the uh, exegetes restricted equity by reference to al-shari'a itself, or what they considered divine injunctions. Al-Qarafi, for example, the famous uh, jurist, the Asharite jurist, uh, defined al-adl, justice, as al-taswiya bil shara equity according to revelation. This allowed uh, the jurist to give priority to specific verses and missed the original intended moral message of the Quran, that of shaking patriarchal culture culture and enslavement and putting Muslims on the road of equal human dignity and emancipation. They missed that because they interpreted justice to be in accordance with the specific divine commandments and prohibitions. Uh, exegetes, those who uh, worked on tafsir al-Quran, adopted a patriarchal and literal approach that translates the verses into legal injunctions, ahkam, mostly shaped by the norms of their context, because they were constructing moral judgments, mostly shaped by the norms of their context. Uh, the third rule of practical reason is consistency, and that is, uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, because I think that it is self-evident. It, it should be a rule that does not include contradiction. So if a rule says that everyone has to pri prioritize her own interest and abide by the obligations towards the others, that is a rule that is contradictory. So it is not a moral rule. Uh, the fourth uh, rule of practical reason is that uh, the rule in order to be considered a moral rule uh, should apply to all individual without discrimination or without exception. And the last one is that moral rule should be for the good of all equally. Indeed, all Muslim jurists agreed in theory that the well-being, maslaha, is the ultimate aim of revelation. And this includes, of course, the well-being of all men and women. Men and women, well, they agreed on that on, in theory, of course. Um, to conclude, uh, colleagues, I would say that uh, understanding ethics and uh, appreciating uh, its significance is of paramount importance in the contemporary Islamic reformers discourse. This paper attempted to develop an understanding of ethics along the line of constructivism, which is a recent development in moral philosophy. That is, in my view, compatible with objective, universal, rational, and Islamic views of morality. I argued, uh, building on Abdul Jabbar and on uh, Adil al Dahir, that there are some considerations and uh, conditions that need to be satisfied for a moral judgment to be considered uh, uh, through, through judgment. Indeed, taking into consideration the conditions of moral judgment allows us to shoot holes in any judgment which presupposes what is false and unacceptable and contradicts reason and rationality. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Mariam Attar, for that uh, very uh, concise and very, and very um, uh, stimulating presentation. And thank you. I think there's already a few questions going up, so uh, I will hold, hold my old, old comments. I, I just think that before I
I open up before I allow the, the questioners to come in. I think it gives a very clear understanding of your paper, and I hope that uh, you know we will see it published soon. Um, but let's uh, let's see the, the kind of uh, discussions or at least questions that come up here. So, Mohammed Fadil, uh, please go ahead. I think what, what before you do that, uh, maybe when you're asking, yes, okay, you're doing exactly what I was going to ask you to do. Just switch on your video, and when you finish, you can just switch it off. Okay, okay I'll take my hand down since I I got my question. Um, uh, Dr. Attar, thank you very much for this very interesting and lucid presentation. I look forward also to reading the paper and reading your other work. Um, I had a if I'm if I, if you may permit me in the moderator, me, I'd like to ask two questions. The first is more, um, I guess, an idea, a suggestion, maybe the way you can pursue this research further, and uh, the second is something that you said in your in your final remarks sort of evaluative it was a kind of an evaluative move of the pre-modern tradition and their view of the relationship of revelation to justice which you thought maybe was mistaken um, so the first question or comment is what is what can we learn about attitudes toward practical ethics from the practices of judgment and in particular I raise this because I'm interested in the ontological status of moral slash legal reasoning. I'm not exactly sure how we distinguish the two, but as you are probably aware in Usul al-Fiqh, one, one of the kitabs is Kitab al ijtihad And one of the very contentious questions is whether in fact there is an ontological reality that the mujtahid is seeking to discover. Right? And um, what I've sort of, my tentative understanding of their position is there was a kind of moral realism that went all the way down to that every juz'iyah, God has a specific rule for it, right? The tahti, the muhatta sort of had this view. Um, and then there's the musawwiba. I guess you could call them who, who, who totally denied the existence of any kind of ontological reality to the particulars of the law, right? Anything derived by had has no ontological reality. Um, instead, you just have a meta rule that you compare the new case to what you know that God has revealed. And it's all a mental representation. Whatever comes to your mind as a von Ghalib, that's your rule. And Ghazali is, 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 is a radically, radically subjectivist and says that the evidence that we use, and this is going to segue to the second point, is radically subjective because what can persuade one person on one mujtahid will not persuade the other mujtahid because the mujtahid's personality is like a magnet. These emarat will, attract, will be attracted to one mujtahid but will be repelled by another. Okay, But there's this kind of tension because nobody wants to say, well, first of all, because there's the, the traditional view based on the hadith that if you do ijtihad and you make a mistake, it's excused and you get a reward for doing the ijtihad. So this is go, goes to the constructivism aspect, I think. Um, what does it mean to do ijtihad, right? So Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, for example, in criticizing the Musawwiba, say, look, Either the mujtahid is following a tariq in his, in his nadar, or he is not, right? And everybody agrees that ijtihad is not arbitrary, right? It's got to follow a method. And so once you admit that reasoning requires a particular method of thinking, then we can say that we, got, we can forget about the conclusion. We can look at the method that you're using. And if the method that you're using is erroneous, it's like garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, and so Fakhreddin al-Razi basically ends up in this position that no matter how you think of it, even if you think it, that ishtihad is purely a mental process and is not finafs al-amr, you can't defend that position unless you totally reject the rationality of, of reasoning. Right? But if you expect, if you accept the rationality of reasoning, then there are going to be right, right ways of reasoning and wrong ways of reasoning. And wrong ways of reasoning 
don't count, right? So I think even in the constructivist view, we still have to take answer this, this question. Are there right ways of reasoning on ethical questions or not, right? Um, because if there's only one right way of reasoning, then we end up also in this absolutist position, right? Um, can you I, come I to your question? I think there's a, there's a ring. Okay, but... Yeah. I'm sorry, let me just hang up okay. on this. All right. Um, I think the question, I don't know, Mariam, do you want to respond to that? No? Do, you, do you want me to respond to... to yeah. I want you to come... comments? The second, like to okay. the second question is much shorter. Okay. second question is much shorter. One of the things I liked in your talk was saying that, you know, what we need is some kind of conception of ethics that isn't absolutist and I and recognize that that's in between absolutism and relativism. That kind of recognizes a certain kind of historicism and ethical value. I thought I heard you saying that, um, and so I'm wondering whether you contradicted yourself at the end. When you had a negative evaluation, for example, of Qarafi's statement, right? That al adlu al taswiya fi shara, right? Um, because what do you do about norms that seem historically acceptable but aren't today, right? So you end up kind of in a theological conundrum. Where you either say, "Oh well, God yat moro besuk," or bezul, right? Which obviously you don't want to say if you want to maintain a commitment to Islamic ethics. But at the same time, you want to be able to say that, um, in some sort of sense, there's a contingency in histor in the hist in the history of ethical value. So I'm, maybe I misunderstood your argument at the beginning, but I thought that the evaluative piece at the end undermined what I understood to be an implicit historicism and ethics that you are seeking to achieve. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Can I, can I, can I? Can yes, I, yes can please I go ahead, yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, thank you, Dr. Fadel. By the way, I read uh, many of your works uh, and I like what you do. Uh, what I meant uh, by uh, when I said like uh, Al-Qarafi's example, when he kind of, it is not only Al-Qarafi, just like one simple example, because I, the paper is not focusing on uh, on fiqh, it, is, it tries to develop like a different uh, uh, perspective uh, of looking into the judgment of actions that is also Islamic, but is not restricted by the fiqh methodology, especially the fiqh de methodology developed, as you said, by Al-Ghazali and the later um, uh, scholars of Islam. Uh, let's say, when I say that uh, Al-Qarafi, when he said, when he defined al-adl as al-taswiya bil-shari, equity according to revelation, uh, it is a very well-known Ash'arite position, uh, which was adopted even by Abul Hassan al-Ash'ari, and it is one of the reasons why he left the Mu'tazila. When there was an, a disagreement of the meaning of adl, the Mu'tazila were trying to develop uh, a, a, a concept of justice that appeals to reason, and that is not an easy thing to do. Al-Ash'ari answered that there is the only meaning uh, of justice is following divine commands. And here he is, Birudna, uh, like he's taking us back to the specific judgments that are mentioned in the Quran. Like for example, uh, Dr. Fadl, let me give you some examples. For example, uh, when the Quran mentions um, certain uh, uh, judgments that are understood uh, like in, uh, like hudud uh, when the Quran mentions uh, certain judgments that um, uh, that are understood by many uh, contemporary uh, ethicists and uh, reformers uh, to be kind of addressed to the people in that time in that context. So the Ash'ari jurists refer us to that. Actually, they followed a theological, a theological voluntarism exactly because they derived even their maqasid from particular judgments that they are found in the Quran. So they kind of based their approach into specific judgments uh, rather than basing their approach on the values that are found in the Quran. 
they didn't try to, um, uh, to practice ishtihad on the meaning of terms like justice, al-ihsan, al-birr, al-ma'roof. No, they referred only to specific judgments which, uh, which are clear for them and they are not problematic. That's why I talked about uh, Al-Qarafi, whom I very much respect for his Al-Qawa'id al-Shari'ya and other work, of course. Uh, the second thing, uh, you talked about Al-Ghazali and how he thought about subjectivity and uh, how he thought that the human reason is uh, unable to actually discover the moral values of actions simply because if we depend on human reason, then we will have many different, uh, then, then we will not be able simply to find it. And that takes us back to the position that, uh, that Abdul Jabbar discussed. You see, there is that position which actually bases the value of the actions in individuals, fil shahba wa nufur. And uh, later on, the Ashaira developed uh, that perception of al husn wal qubah and they said, that al-husn wal qubah for some people huwa ma'na ma'na kamal which kind of indicates perfection uh, for some it indicates uh, simply human uh, preference and human interest and uh, for the ash'arites they said that for them al-husn wal qubah what is uh, good and bad is simply determined uh, by the reward and punishment mentioned um, or the divine reward of punishment for certain actions. So they derived uh, the rules or they derived like their moral theory from this, uh, uh, from this uh, voluntaristic uh, framework. And uh, that was, by the way, discussed in detail by Al Qadi Abdul Jabbar Al Asadabad. Well, that was my specialty. I did my PhD on Al Qadi Abdul Jabbar. And, you know, like before doing uh, my work on Qadi Abdul Jabbar, I was asking uh, about like uh, people uh, in the Islamic tradition who developed kind of more reasonable, more rational approach to, the, to ethics, to the judgments of actions. And, um, I was told by my professors in the University of Jordan back then, like, look at the Qadi Abdul Jabbar, look at the Mu'tazila back then. And why I wasn't young, I had no idea who are the Mu'tazila or who are the Ashaira, by the way. Now, um, uh, the other thing is um, uh, when you talked about uh, my contradiction at the end, that uh, we have a certain methodology and uh, I was trying to develop that methodology from the thought of Al Qadi Abdul Jabbar on uh, that methodology, which looks into the conditions or presuppositions of moral judgments. Now, in order to distinguish between what is a moral judgment and what is not a moral judgment, they came up with certain uh, conditions developed by Qadi Abdul Jabbar and also developed later on by Adel al-Zahir, who is not working in Islamic studies, by the way, he's a philosopher. So I thought that uh, those are uh, necessary conditions, but they are not sufficient, by the way, for deciding whether a certain judgment is a moral judgment or not. They are necessary, but they are not um, uh, not final, not, uh, not sufficient, because there are other conditions that have to be fulfilled, depending on the judgment, depending on the context, depending on our knowledge of, uh, uh, of human psychology, of anthropology, of, uh, of our, ex uh, our experience, and so on. So I'm not saying that we come up with the rational ethics that is absolute law. We are coming by with, um, to, uh, we are trying to come up with a methodology that will help us to distinguish between what is ethical, moral, and what is not ethical and not moral. I hope I would like to answer partly your question. I know it's not a full answer. I hope I did. Some... Yeah. Thank you. Thank we, you can, we can discuss it privately. Yeah. That would be nice. Thank you. Yeah. So let me um, uh, invite uh, Oais Sarafuddin, Dr. Rafuddin from University of South Africa. Uh, let me ask you to you know, pose your questions um, uh, in, in as, as brief and 
concise matter. Kalle Wedella. Great. Thank you, Professor Tayyip. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Attar. Um, I really enjoyed your paper. I'm interested to know why Adil Dahir uh, thinks that, you know, moral judgments, as, as you put it in your paper, have no ontological connotations, especially given the fact that, you know, one would expect that such judgments are ultimately grounded in metaethics, which, of course, are presupposed upon particular types of metaphysics. And um, such metaphysics cause also, of course, particular types of affective dispositions on behalf of those who hold them. Uh, these dispositions then being tied to, to, to their own ethics. And so I just want to know, how does one separate, you know, metaphysics and ontology from, from ethics? Uh, or how does, how does Dyer justify his statement? Thank you. Yes, uh, Adil Dahir and others definitely separate uh, the moral judgments from onto ontological uh, connotations because for them, like ontological connotation, it's, if, if something has an ontological uh, connotation, then it is like part of the structure of this world. It is, uh, but it's real, it is true. And that means that it is absolute, it is static. So it's, uh, and, uh, that's why uh, when we, we say ontological connotations, we are talking about things that are a little bit strange in my view, like how the moral judgment have uh, ontological connotations. Well, I understand the uh, voluntarist view, which is that uh, moral judgments are based in uh, revelation. And uh, then those would argue that the ontological uh, foundations of the moral judgment are found in particular judgment, ahkam. But I uh, think, because I talked about restricted constructivism. And uh, why I said uh, restricted constructivism, because uh, maybe if we can talk about, uh, I wouldn't call it ontological uh, connotation, but if we are want to talk about something that is universal, that is static in a certain way, that is uh, uh, categorical, we can refer to the moral values uh, that is, are found in the Quran and in other scriptures, by the way, and also in, in universal uh, morality, uh, concepts like justice, like mercy, like goodness, uh, those are universal. And those are, if you wish, uh, consider them ontological, uh, that's fine, but they are not really ontological, they are, uh, they are not ontological, I think, but I really uh, don't know exactly what to call them, where to put them, but uh, what uh, about, we can say that, for example, this cup ontologically exists in the world, that uh, I exist in the world, I am ontologically present, but I have no idea how would you say that moral judgments actually exist in the world. That will take us back to ma'na that inheres in actions, which is, uh, the theory developed by the early Mu'tazila, that the moral uh, values, good and bad, are uh, ma'ani that inherit in judgment, in actions. And, but this is what was uh, actually rejected by um, many of the later scholars, including Abdul Jabbar, who argued against relativism, against this kind of uh, moral ontology or ethical uh, realism and against uh, um, uh, ethical voluntarism or divine command theory, if you wish. I don't know, Professor, if I was clear enough. <clears throat> yes, I think, I think that's sufficient for now. I think it's, uh, it's interesting that, that you are also presenting it as a kind of a discourse you know, about how these ideas are developing over, over time. At least in the way that you presented, you know, the position of Fadi Abdul Jabbar in this in this kind of history. I'm just wondering in relation to that. Although I'm going to ask, uh, I know there's a, somebody before me, but I'll use that to to say to what extent was this um, position um, influenced, you know, exactly by um, uh, by, by Usul al-Fiqh, which is then thinking about maqasid, you know, around at that at the same time. You know, because this is also, I mean, at least it's coming from a different perspective, but there seems to be some kind of a, a confluence between thinking about maqasid and thinking about objective moral judgment, moral judgments in the way you are suggesting. 
Yes, you are. You are definitely right, uh, Professor Tayyub. Uh, yes, there uh, there is some uh, there is some relation. Like in one of the previous articles, actually, I I argued uh, for the theory of maqasid to be based on a different meta ethical uh, meta ethical foundation, in order to put the maqasid or the what is called like the principles of the purposes of law on uh, the proper foundation, because in my view, and that is definitely different than the views um, that, um, for example, of Al-Ghazali and other Ash'arites, that those scholars who uh, worked on maqasid, they constructed maqasid, but those are their maqasid. They are not really the purposes of God. They, they thought that they are discovering the maqasid in the Quran. However, in reality, what actually happened is that they constructed their maqasid, taking into consideration, yes, uh, certain ahkam, judgment found in the, in, in the Quran and the Sunnah, and also their own context and their own uh, social experience. Okay, I'll come back, come back to that just now. Let me give the floor to Sergio Salim Scacciodini. Hope I'm saying your name correctly. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I was going to ask some because I dissenters many things. Um, in the West, also, ethics has become a popular concept. And I think that the First World War, the, the, first, the Second World War, held ethics beyond Christianity. And when you mentioned voluntarism, that's what I thought of, because uh, for example, when I teach Arab students, one of the most difficult concepts to explain, and not most difficult, a concept that we do not naturally see in the same way is ethics. If you say ethics, they will immediately say akhlaq. So every time I have to tell them, you can have very good akhlaq and in a way still be a bad person. Um, because one thing is to be more other, something else is to be good, what makes you good. But in their view, what makes you good is following the law or what people tell you that the law is. Um, for example, let's say if I'm driving along the road and I see a lady in distress and, and she's alone, cool. It would yeah. not be quite appropriate here for me to stop and help her and give her a lift. Okay, it would be better to either call the police or expect another lady to help her. Sorry uh, in that case, you. sorry for interrupting you. The concept of good. Can you ask the question, please? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, but I don't think I'm so. I'm saying, can you ask a question? What is your question? Or yeah. Um. Can you hear me now? Because I know my internet signal is very. We can, we can hear you, but we can hear you very clearly. No. Yes, we can hear you better now, yes, but can you ask the question? question? Yes, the question yes. is first, don't you, don't you think that we need to define ethics before? Um, what do we mean by ethics from a point of view of Islam or an Islamic ethics? And I think that the elephant in the room right. is, for Excuse example, me. slavery. Sergio yes. Scatolini, you can ask a question. I don't want you to answer it. You should leave Professor Al Attar to answer the question. Yes, yes, that's why. Uh, we speak of Islamic ethics, an example of slavery. Slavery uh, was allowed by all the textual, I mean, the, Excuse me, Hello. evidence, practical. Yeah. 
Excuse me, yes, okay. I'm really going to interrupt you here because we cannot hear you very clearly. So I'm going to take your question and pose it to Professor Latar and, and then we'll go on from here. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is interesting what you mentioned that uh, some uh, students of yours, Arab students, when they talk about uh, akhlaq and goodness, they uh, distinguish between those and they kind of associate goodness with the, uh, with the religious obligation. But uh, by the way, when we talk about ethical voluntarism or divine command theory, uh, that is not only in Islam, that is very much in Christianity and Judaism as well. Actually, all the Protestant tradition, they accept uh, divine command theory or ethical voluntarism. There are now uh, philosophers in the United States, some of them they even teach at the University of Yale, who call themselves divine command theorists. Calvin, uh, for example, the, the well-known Protestant, uh, who else, like almost everyone in the Protestant tradition believes in ethical voluntarism. So uh, when, and when you said like, how would you define ethics in Islam? Well, I mentioned that uh, ethics was never a separate tradition in Islam. Uh, but uh, all the Islamic disciplines, kalam, fiqh, uh, tasawwuf, uh, and al-akhlaq, uh, al in the Greek tradition, if you wish, they all have uh, ethical theories that should be taken into consideration. And I don't believe in that binary uh, West against the East or Islam and, uh, and secularism, that they, uh, they, there is always that opposition. No, and um, uh, I believe that uh, uh, knowledge is culminative and uh, so is moral knowledge as well. And uh, for example, bioethics, although was started in the West, but now Muslim scholars are actually adding uh, to that field of ethics. So I don't believe in putting like, uh, how, how would you say, like a, a line between what is Islamic ethics and what is not Islamic ethics. Because just as like the West benefited from Islamic knowledge, the Muslims are benefiting from the Western knowledge and so on. That makes sense. So, Mariam, the question that he has posed, he has written it on the side there, I think, which uh, uh, makes it very clear. He said, wouldn't you agree that the discourses on maqasid sharia are probably the best attempt at positing relative, constructed, objective, good and evil? It's in the chat session. Sorry, doctor, uh, which question the is same, that? The because... same. It's, a, it's on the chat. I don't know if you can see that. Yes, I but, can see it. That's, uh, yeah, that's a little yeah. bit which says, I have always had the impression that the absolute role of yeah. the scripture. Yes. Uh, okay. But I think the, the main the question, question is at the bottom. Yeah. Would you agree that the discourse on Maqas the Sharia are probably the best attempt uh, at causing relative constructed? I agree that, uh, well, that the most popular um, approach uh, adopted by uh, some Muslim reformers has been so far maqasid uh, al-sharia, but I um, I recently come to believe that indeed maybe that is there is something wrong in, in that theory. There is something wrong because like how come that uh, so many people uh, who um, uh, who fully accept maqasid al-sharia they were unable to make any change. I mean, like even some uh, more contemporary scholars, modern scholars who adopted Maqasid al-Sharia, uh, like the Tunisian, I, I just, uh, it skipped my mind. When he talks about different uh, normative moral judgments, he refers us to the same uh, moral judgments that were adopted by the medieval scholars. So, um, I argued somewhere else, as I mentioned before, but yes, I agree that just to answer your, answer your question that the Maqasid al-Sharia are probably the best attempt uh, to positing relative and constructive objective good and evil. Most probably, yes, you are right. Sergio, just to make it so simple, yes. I think you are adding something significantly different by introducing the Kalam of meta-ethical questions to that. Yes, I tried to do that in an article published in the Journal of Islamic Ethics in 2017. Okay. So I'll go on to the next question, Musa Ibrahim. Please go ahead. Sir Musa. 
Assalamu uh, alaikum. That's the other Musa first. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, just for a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, Professor Al Aftar, for your presentation. My question is since, on the one hand, you are talking about uh, contemporary Muslim moral thinking. And on the other, we have we also have literature that is talking about transformation of knowledge production in Muslim society, especially uh, with uh, scholarship on democratization of Islamic uh, knowledge. And when you are thinking, I was also thinking about Professor Abdul Qadir Tayyip thesis about revelation and Tawi which seems to suggest that there is an ending discovery of meaning uh, in the context of Muslim discourse. So my first question is how productive do you think engaging with the concept of morality as both conceptual and analytical tool uh, is in studying uh, contemporary Muslims? My second question is the idea of morality, especially public morality is political. So we are also dealing with literature about absence of ideal Muslim society for reformers to achieve their reform agendas. So do you think we can say that broadly speaking, the idea of Islamic morality among uh, uh, in studying contemporary Muslim is elusive. I want to hear your view. I hope my questions are clear. Uh, yes, your question is very clear, but I need to make something uh, also uh, clear that I am not an anthropologist and I am, uh, I am not studying uh, the uh, discourse the, of the contemporary Muslim uh, people, I am uh, I am approaching the issue from a philosophical perspective. So, uh, like, it's not my concern. Well, it is important to know, and it is definitely related to ethics, uh, anthropology, and sociology, and so on. And but it is uh, not uh, not something that I meant to talk about. I didn't mean to study the uh, contemporary or the modern or even the classical uh, conceptions of uh, or um, the morality of the people back then. I'm just not anthropologist. And uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe that we can uh, essentialize, like take like talk about the essence of uh, the Muslim morality. Like there is nothing like this. Like there are different theories developed by Muslims who belong to different, uh, different uh, sects and who belong to the same sect but have different uh, philosophical ideas. Uh, so I don't think that Islam is a monolithic tradition. I don't think that the Muslims are like uh, one uh, entity who think the same and uh, who have the same moral foundations. And I don't think that we can uh, uh, so I think that maybe that answers your question that I'm approaching the topic from a philosophical tradition. And uh, you know what, uh, since I, uh, I was first interested in studying uh, the place of reason in the Islamic uh, thought in developing uh, different moral ideas, that was my main concern, searching for reason, for rationality in the history of Islamic thought. So I found interesting ideas in the work of Al Qadi Abdul Jabbar al Mu'tazali in his voluminous work called Al Mughni fi Abwab al Tawheed wal Adl. But I found certain concepts there problematic. So I thought, like, what does he mean by al Aql wal Aqlaniya, al Aql wal Aqlaniya? Can he actually develop that? And I found that development which, that it happened on the hand of a contemporary Arab Muslim philosopher who, uh, by the way, is not working in Islamic studies. He does speak about Islam sometimes, but he is mainly a philosopher. So I don't think maybe, uh, I, I don't know if I adapt uh, kind of approach to your question uh, 
but uh, that is what I can say about it, I guess, uh, Dr. Nissan. Okay, thank, thank you so much for that. I think that's also a good way sometimes of clarifying your, 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 your the, the, the sort of the field, uh, but thank you very much. I think certainly there are a lot of implications for what you say, but I, I think that that's, uh, that's, let's go to now the, not the Musa Ibrahim, but Ibrahim Musa. Please go ahead, uh, Ibrahim, sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Abu Qadir, and thank you for to to uh, <clears throat> Dr. Attar for her presentation. So um, I I I I, for, I do agree that you know this question of uh, ethical constructivism is a a very very helpful way uh, to go forward with this. I I've I've grappled with this a little bit uh, in, in some uh, in some work, uh, but I have not been able to do the kind of work that you uh, uh, have done. Uh, I mean, it's always in the back of my mind. So I, I, I sent you a talk I gave in Ankara some years ago. Uh, I just sent it a couple of minutes ago, uh, where I started thinking about the question of tradition as a constructivist. And that comes from the inspiration of the work of Barbara Hernstein Smith, uh, Bruno Latour, and, and others. And But their main inspiration it's also, you know, uh, Kuhn uh, was also one of the people mm. who benefited from the work of a guy called a Polish mm. seratologist called Ludwig Fleck. And mm -hmm. so Fleck's work, so there might be constructivism and constructivism, uh, different kinds of constructivism, uh, more kind of an anthropological constructivism or and a philosophical one, because you you highlight it, uh, you know, among the people that you think engage in in a constructivist uh, idiom is is uh, a Rawls, right? Uh, did you mention yes. Rawls in your paper? That's right. Yes, I did. And, and, yeah, and and so and so Rawls and and obviously there's also a Kantian reading of of constructivism, uh, 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 and and so on. So what I find helpful in your presentation is. The, the question that you bring us back to, and that is that, you know, um, that we want to understand the relation between what we call knowledge and what we experience as reality. So I will start with kind of what I call a, 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 uh, a constructivist epistemology first that precedes the uh, constructivist uh, philosophical. And, and, um, and you know, so the a constructivist uh, account of, of of cognition, of truth, and science, and 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 matters that we conceive as experience and so on, um, deal with is is that all these things are not prior to, but and not independent of our sensory, perceptual, motor, manipulative, and conceptual discursive attitudes, but it's it's emerging from that. Now, a lot of people is going to find that extremely uh, subjective. There is a subjective element that who decides how does this happen? And I know we're going to get that question. So I think I, I, I like uh, the, the line you're taking. The question is, uh, and, and maybe you will address it uh, going forward. How do you align uh, the constructivist reading uh, to the existing ahkam that are endorsed by uh, by revelation by the Quran and Sunnah, and and do you keep that as isolated and separate, especially the muamalat, or are these also subject to 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 a constructivist reading? I would say yes, it is subject to a constructivist reading, but I was just uh, uh, you know dealing with that. So the question is then, what the Professor Fadl raised the question is the kind of theological question. So if these revealed norms and the previous speaker also raised the question of slavery might have been something practical or something practical in the past, but in 2021 it is not, then how do we conceptualize notions that are, how do we conceptualize notions that are, that are in the revelation and, 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 and what status do we give them? Um, are, the, the general habit of Muslim scholars is to give them a, the status of an ontological moral fact. The general habit is. The other way that I would look at it, that these are manifestations of the good. You know, 
give women half the inheritance what you give men. Uh, these are all manifested. And why do I say that? I base it on the kind of readings or, or kind of promptings by people like Shawalula and others who think of that, that ahkam and the rules are actually the adat and the customs of the Arabs in the seventh century. And these customs are part, become part of a, of, a, of a practice at a particular time. And, and here we need to go to certain kinds of moral anthropology and the history of Islamic law and so on. And that way we see that as a manifestation of the good, but it's not permanently the good. The, the, the notion of the good in a constructivist idiom in a constructive view, that, that the manifestation of the good at a different time will be the opposite of what it was at a particular time, which raises the question that you raised in your paper that, you know, how do we deal with the question of, of moral relativism, or do you not say that is moral relativism? You say these are the manifestations and the incarnations of the good. So, uh, uh, so that the question, the theological question doesn't become the block, so to speak. I hope my, my, uh, Query is 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 is, is uh, or comment is clear. Thank you. Uh, it is very clear, Doctor uh, Ibrahim. Thank you very much. And let me tell you something. Like when I first came across the term constructivism, it was in an article that you wrote, and that article uh, was about uh, genetic engineering food, genetic engineering food. It is, uh, you mentioned that most probably Muslims have to do ethics uh, in a uh, constructivist way. At that time, I had no idea what it is. But then I was looking at uh, the works of Adil Daher and I thought, oh gosh, like this is constructivism. And I wanted to get out of that conundrum of that problem, like that ethics is um, either uh, absolute, static, or it is relative. And definitely, like, if we look at Islamic ethics, if uh, Islam is a universalizing religion, so we definitely aspire to say that uh, Islamic values are universal. They are not relative to the Muslims on one side, but we also emphasize that there is something special about Islamic ethics. Uh, but what is that special thing is something maybe that is also mentioned in the Quran. But as you said, those judgments, particular judgments, which you could manifest, I like the idea, must manifestations of the good in certain time, and that change from time to time, and that goes uh, with the with the belief that uh, specific judgments, specific moral judgments. Like, for example, um, the rules that are related to marriage and divorce and so on, which are definitely something that uh, Muslim feminists, and I worked uh, lately with a group of Islamic feminists who are doing amazing work in uh, interpreting uh, those uh, verses and uh, constructing a new uh, view of morality. So yes, like I would say those judgments are, um, they, um, I wouldn't call them like part of ontological structures or they are not ontological morality, no. They are not fixed, they are not facts. They are, uh, I would, but I wouldn't call them relative. Maybe it's a nice way of saying that they are manifestations of the good and the manifestation of the good that can change according to different context, historical context and the practical context that we find ourselves in. Um, but uh, when we talk about certain moral values like justice, like Ihsan and so on, those are values that I don't think we can talk about them as ontologically existing values apart from saying that they were uh, written and they were, uh, they, they were uh, in the Quran, they were part of the guidance given to humankind, that does not contradict which, uh, with the ma'roof, which what people actually already know somehow. But, um, and that's why I called this version of constructivism uh, restricted constructivism. 
because not everything is constructed. Like those moral values, like uh, they are not constructed. They are uh, permanent, they are universal, they are for all time and places like justice, for example. So what we are constructing, we are constructing as the judges of the past, as the fuqaha did in the past, they constructed uh, certain judgments. People should construct the moral judgments from uh, existing moral ideas that they have. They don't construct them. They, they, there is a difference between construction and invention from nothing. We are not inventing from nothing. We should be constructing moral judgment from pre-existing uh, morality, from the uh, eternal or universal values that are found in the Quran, taking into consideration different fields of knowledge like psychology, anthropology, uh, science, and so on, and taking into consideration our own historical context. I think. Thank you very much. I think there's a lot of questions coming up, and I see the two hands there already sometimes. So I'm going to let them come in, and then we'll have to come to a close. I know that you have taken a lot of your time. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure we're only scratching the surface, but uh, let me um, ask Andrea Casatella to uh, come in now. Mm. Uh, sorry, may I just ask one uh, simple thing? Uh, will I will I receive all the comments because I am unable to read in the same time as I'm listening to? Yes, yes, you? yes, yes, yes. Okay. We will, we will oh, do that. Yeah. Thank you. I am. I would normally there are no other questions that would normally read them out for you, but I think let let us hear the questions and then we can okay. we, then we can get to the chat. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Andrea, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Professor Alathar. Thank you for your for your talk. Uh, uh, my internet was interrupting, so I might have missed some some points. But I, I understood that you wanted to separate constructivism from from ontology, keeping some form of uh, uh, epistemological proceduralism. So in the triads between epistemology, ethics, and ontology, what I found somehow missing is is what what is the role from a philosophical point of view or the political here, in the construction of what are the relevant uh, uh, presupposition that make a, a judgment moral. Uh, um, and uh, and I, I felt uh, maybe that was, was a perception, but uh, how, uh, what is the scope of restrictivism? What is sc the scope of restriction in your constructivism? I had a sense that uh, some of the procedure you were referring to in order to think about a, a practical reason uh, uh, kept certain fixity on things that they can be in fact thought as constructed. In fact, if you think about you know the, the rule of logic according to the principle of no contradiction, then people may disagree that that is the relevant one or should be the relevant one to think about uh, uh, morality uh, in general. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, Andre. I guess like maybe I talked about the presupposition of moral uh, principles and uh, the rule of logic. Uh, the rule of projects related to, sorry, can you say that again, the last uh, statement? Yes, I mean, so some people, especially in, in, in contemporary philosophy, you know, they, 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 they might disagree with the idea that the principle of non-contradiction is the absolute principle that rules under both epistemology and morality. I because it presupposes that that concept grasps the, the essence of reality, and so that somebody might have a more uh, uh, a uh, complex view of the relation between uh, 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 um, meaning, uh, uh, word, meaning, and object. Yes. Right. Actually, like uh, constructivism is a new emerging uh, field in ethics, and it was developed like after the development of postmodernism and uh, uh, what is called like uh, uh, mainly the post uh, post. Uh, uh, postmodernism and uh, uh, the post uh, what else like th that I'm talking about the uh, the field or the the movement of Talal Assad and who's followed in his tradition as well. When we talk about constructivism, what appealed to me in constructivism, Andrea, is the fact that they are in the same time trying to avoid ethical relativism. Okay, and at the same time trying to avoid uh, moral absolutism. 
and uh, but the rule of logic of uh, contradiction that you refer to, I definitely would disagree with anyone who would argue against that. And I am aware that they are, there are philosophers like in uh, the tradition of uh, postmodernism who do so, do. Uh, uh, who do have a lot of uh, things to say about that. But I would say that uh, mainly according to them, uh, morality is relative, relative not only to culture, also to individuals. And that goes well, for example, even with existential philosophy. But I think that we are in that time uh, of uh, where we need to find like a, a common ground, a common ground. There are things we have to agree upon. Look, like I don't believe that the rule of contradiction can be, can be, can be contested. I think like something is sometimes things are either right or wrong. Uh, either they, they are uh, correct or they are incorrect. And the, uh, the ideas that were developed mainly by this contemporary Lebanese philosopher, who, by the way, now lives in the United States, um, uh, Adel al-Dahir, uh, the ideas that he developed, he had, like many articles where he engages with contemporary philosopher who follow like in uh, different postmodernist um, post directions. And um, he develops those principles that are called, uh, of course, inspired by John Rawls and by Kant as well, that are called the rules of practical reason. And what you can see, I don't see anything controversial about the rules of practical reason. I don't think anything controversial by saying that morality trumps any other consideration or by saying that we have to be consistent or by saying that moral rules have to apply to everyone or that we have to give like a priority to morality. I, I, I think that those are kind of basic rules that uh, most of the people would agree upon, maybe not, not uh, some of the philosopher who would argue that uh, the rule of contradiction is not, uh, not correct, well, but I found that uh, very, very strange. Thank you very much. I hope we can talk about it. Yeah. Yes. That's a great talk to, 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 to you open up questions and we, we, yes. we are following up yes. further open questions. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask Aslam. I put Aslam as the last question, but I see Surya Bibi Bayat has come in. I will allow you a short question. And Aslam, please uh, keep your short question or comment and question short as well, if you don't mind. If I can use my prerogative as your teacher to, to ask you to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, alaykum thank, thank you, Prof. Uh, Mariam, for a great lecture. I just want to bring, I just want to bring you back to the issue of divine, divine command theory outside of a certain Islamic cosmology. Uh, you know, the pre-modern scholars that you deal with, uh, the work of Qadi Abdul Jabbar and the Mu'tazilites, uh, the issue of divine command wasn't really problematic for them. They dealt with the issue of ta'arud, you know, al-aql wa naql. But uh, in, in the modern uh, phase, we find uh, divine command itself being problemat problematized and, and people making a case for, you know, just a rational basis of, uh, for ethics. So what I'm asking you really is, how do we think about the teleological consequences of ethical judgments and actions? Uh, I, I can give you a Fischer's example. Uh, you know, in our day and age, you can make a rational case for eating a pork sandwich and it wouldn't cause anyone harm and you can even go further and make a, uh, you know, a case for it being uh, uh, to the advantage of the public good. But from a, pre uh, a prohibition that was put in place by God. So essentially it brings us back to the ontological status of value. Uh, so... Basically, I mean, what do you do with this idea of an afterlife and transcendence and consequences for your actions, where, you know, it is more about salvation of the self than about equality and dignity and freedom and justice in this world? Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll obey my teacher to uh, agree. <laughs> may, I, may I answer? Yes, please go ahead. Um, well, Aslam, to say first of all, like when, uh, when I talk like about ethical voluntarism and, or divine command theory, um, when I studied the work of Abdul Jabbar, and he talked about the meaning of good and evil, or was a big issue back then. And it uh, unfortunately, like uh, in the modern time, or uh, contemporary ethicists kind of try to avoid the issue altogether, not to talk about it, because it became like traditionally accepted by the, the mainstream Muslims. The Ashwarite view that good and evil are decided by divine command and prohibitions uh, kind of, uh, well, if you ask a normal Muslim on the street, if I ask my students, like, is good good because, is what is good good because uh, uh, God commanded it or did God command something because it is good? Like most of the students uh, who think like about the problem would say, no, God commanded what is good because it is good. Not that anything becomes good because God commanded it. And by the way, yes, it was discussed by the early Mu'tazilites, it was discussed by the Ash'arites and became a dogma in the Islamic thought. That is one thing. The other thing is the, how do you relate it to the issue of salvation? Because at the end, that is definitely like in the main concern of any um, uh, Muslim uh, believer, uh, the issue of salvation. That is why I uh, mentioned the distinction made by some scholars between al-mu'amalat wal ibadat and between the Mu'tazilite scholars, between al-taklif al-aqli wal taklif al-shari'i. The Taklif al-Aqli includes uh, everything that uh, is related to this world, to how we treat each other, like to politics, like somebody mentioned politics before. But issues, uh, Taklif al-Shari'i, according to Abdul Jabbar, and I'm not talking about one person, he represented like a trend in his time, okay? And that was before the race of Ash'arism. According to Abdul Jabbar, Taklif al Shari includes the, uh, mainly uh, the rituals, uh, mainly like praying, the fasting, the pilgrimage, like the, uh, what distinguishes uh, the, the, what, are, what is the rituals in Islam, uh, not the moral. So when we talk about rational obligations, we are talking about moral obligations. Of course, the question that uh, came up is how about the people? who are non-Muslims then? And uh, are they also rationally obliged? Of course, the rational obligation belong, like applies to the Muslims and to the non-Muslims. Uh, according to my reading of Abdul Jabbar, uh, he seems to agree that if you are not a Muslim and you do what is good uh, uh, according to reason, you also deserve salvation, you also deserve to be saved. And, uh, uh, and also there was a group of uh, Khawarij uh, before the Mu'tazila called Al-Atrafiyya. Al-Atrafiyya uh, were arguing the issue whether the people who live in, in places that uh, uh, were not reached by Islam are, how are they going to be? Um, how are they going to be judged? So al-atrafiya would say that they would be uh, judged according to taklif al-aqli, what they know, what uh, they, what is good and what is bad. Like uh, also, Kevin Reinhardt wrote a book on that called "Before Revelation." So, what is the judgment of actions before? Uh, before Islam, or uh, even before the other monotheistic uh, religions. So the issue uh, was discussed by um, in Kalam and is definitely related to divine command theory. Uh, it is not uh, even in uh, even in Christianity or in the West, divine command theory is not a new uh, issue to be discussed by the divine command theorists. Yeah, Protestant uh, theologians like uh, long ago Don Scotts, Don Scotts, for example, uh, was a divine command theorist. Well, and so was Descartes, by the way. So it's not a new position. 
final question is from Soraya Bibi Bayat. Are you so late? Um, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Can you please um, keep it short, right? Sorry for its time. I will, I will try to be short, but I'm from grassroots. We take long to get to the point because we don't have all the, um, the, the words to really enunciate how we feel. But one thing that I would say as I start is, oh, almighty creator, guide my tongue and my thoughts for anything I say or think not to harm anyone, but for the simplest truth of thy existence. And that truth, justice, and peace is required from all of us in humanity. Because I think Professor Mariam, you just mentioned something very important. You talked about mainstream. And in the, on the grassroots and the work that we do, we're very tired of the mainstream because the mainstream is very much about the academically qualified. And for us who had to deal with what apartheid had done to the majority of people, not having the education because of poverty, but poverty is not an issue in relation to your stomach. The poverty of the mind is what we have to deal with at grassroots. And that the mere fact that you have religious structures coming up in the political arena and, and swaying people to their way of thinking and promoting themselves as very important and ethical people when in fact they are involved in so much corruption, especially when they come from Muslim because we have found that in the mainstream, when we're dealing, and I hope I'm not gonna offend the men here, but mainstream is very much a male stream. And we need to get in there with detergents and cleaning it up because the mindset is horrendous in our country. That's why we have a crisis now of gender-based violence. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soraya. I agree on everything that you have said, indeed. But, and by the way, like uh, uh, being in academia, like even somebody is like really knowledgeable in all the ethical theories and can talk about ethics, that doesn't mean he is a good person or that he, she is a good person. Like doing like uh, theoretical ethics is something and coming to real life situation is a different thing. Yes, one can be inspired by moralists or people in the uh, academia working on ethics, but like, gosh, like I was very much surprised when I saw like, I, wa I was really fond of, of uh, the work of somebody, uh, I don't want to, uh, to call names, but he's American scholar working on global justice. He has a wonderful work on global justice. And you know what? He was accused of, uh, of rape by, by many people. So I found that very strange, well, but I don't, I don't know. I don't believe everything that I say. they say. Maybe some people, uh, this is just a trap uh, because they don't want him to speak or they don't want him to be respected like that is the other politicians. And maybe it's true, I don't know. But definitely we have to separate between uh, what is the theoretical study of a topic, even if it's ethics and uh, between uh, the practices and the, the behavior of the people. I agree with that, Suraya. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mariam. I think that I uh, thank you first for this uh, really uh, for an excellent, at lucid uh, presentation. I think what you've also done for us, I think, is from what I can remember, is is uh, introducing Kazi Abdul Jabbar. Uh, in, a, in a very systematic, I mean, the first, I have been reading him sections of his work, and, and I know that uh, uh, since the, his, the discovery of his manuscript, a lot of people have been reading it, but he still remains, uh, or at least general Mu'tazilite thinking and Mu'tazilite thought still remains on the margins of uh, academic discussions. And so thank you very much for introducing him. But even more than that, also putting him in conversation you know, with uh, the ethical constructivists that you've done. So I think that's even more uh, challenging and also uh, you know, enlightening, at least for myself. I'm sure that we're going to be continuing our, this conversation for some time, but uh, as a chairperson, I have to sadly uh, close off by saying you know, thank you.
uh, for, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this talk and I'm looking forward to receiving like any email of you. I would like uh, this seminar to be a beginning for like a constructive, yes. a constructive uh, uh, dialogue that will continue from here. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Abdul Qadir for inviting me. This was amazing, really. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming.